Welcome to the Summit for Wellness podcast, where we help you climb to the peak of your health. And now, here is your host, Brian Carroll. The gut and the brain, two very important areas of the body that regulates how we feel and how we function. Yet when we talk about health, usually our guests focus on the gut and how dysfunction there can cause a whole list of issues in the rest of the body. It is easy to forget about the brain when it comes to our health, even though the brain is a command center for the body, sending signals out to regulate hormones, digest food, and even protects us from potentially harmful scenarios. What's up, everyone? I'm Brian Carroll, and I'm here to share nutrition and fitness tips to make wellness less complicated. And today we have Greg Gerard joining us to share how we can take better care of our brains so that the rest of the body functions correctly. But before we dive into this episode, I just want to talk briefly about our friends over at Athletic Greens. Their greens powder is made from 75 whole food ingredients which helps us to take in all the forgotten nutrients like vitamins and minerals into our daily diets. One scoop per day is all you need, and I usually add it into my morning smoothie. So if you go to summitforwellness.com slash greens, you can learn more. Now let's dive right into my conversation with Greg Gerard. Greg Gerard is a nutritional therapy practitioner with a background in psychology. He is located in the northern Georgia mountains with his wife and 10-month-old baby boy, and he is an avid whitewater kayaker. Thanks for coming onto the show, Greg. Yeah, thank you for having me, Brian. Of course. Um, first off, I just want to clarify, mountains in Georgia, does that actually I'm, exist? I know, exactly. <laughs> um, most people think it's uh, Georgia is... Um, there's Atlanta and then there's like cow pastures, but, uh, but there are some like uh, 2000 to like um, 4,000 plus uh, foot mountains um, in the North Georgia mountains. And it's the, the foothills of the Appalachian trail. So there, there are some mountains they get, they get a good bit bigger in North Carolina um, and on up, up the East coast. But uh, yeah, we have mountains in Georgia. <laughs> Yeah, I know the Appalachian Trail has quite a bit of elevation gain, so yeah. it must be pretty rolly over there, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah, there's there's some, it's definitely not abrupt like Wyoming, but, uh, <laughs> and there <laughs> there's some out here that you're like, oh, that's that's definitely a mountain, it's not a rolling hill, but, but there are some rolling hills for sure. Well, let's dive into your background a little bit because you have a background in psychology, you're a nutritional therapy practitioner, and you do a lot of stuff with working on the brain. So can you talk about what got you interested in all of this? Yeah. Um, honestly, about the psychology part, that was uh, my my parents' um, long, drawn-out divorce in middle school. Uh, when I was in middle school, I uh, became enamored in why... Uh, Two people could get together and make a couple of kids, but then uh, fall out of love. So, <laughs> and then for the longest time, I thought that I was going to be a psychologist, and um, and uh, got my degree in that, and then was heading to grad school for psychology. And um, a whitewater kayaking injury um, uh, took me out of kayaking and uh, crossfitting, and um, I was in a pretty pretty bad mood, kind of rough place. And um, I'd been through depression myself years before toward the end of college. But uh, this shoulder injury um, began uh, a crazy long health journey. But basically, in a nutshell, I changed, I had to heal my gut to fully heal the chronic inflammation in my shoulder. And um, my wife's a physical therapist. And I uh, she helped me, you know, before I changed anything in my diet, I was just attacking it with uh, exercise and, you know, PT, yoga, stuff like that. And then was, um, a, and then got to about 70% healed, but it wasn't, that wasn't enough. I'd go kayaking like, I went kayaking like once or twice that year in the, the year that it was injured and I uh, didn't need surgery and, um, and a and it just didn't feel solid. So a friend of mine asked me, well, how clean are you eating? 
and this is 2010, so I didn't know that much at all. And you know, said, well, I don't eat off the floor, you know. And then she said, no, like, well, what all do you eat, you know? And then I told her, and as I went through the list of what I ate, her face got more and more disgusted. And uh, and it's kind of neat. She's a good friend of mine uh, and also a client now. But um, but she was like, oh, you you, I bet you have horrible allergies and um. You must feel like crap in the gym. It was a, a CrossFit um, trainer friend of mine. And I said, well, everybody feels like crap. This is CrossFit, you know? And she's like, yeah, that's a good point. But you you, you could feel a lot better in here. Um, and because at that time I was like going in and just doing, you know, stuff that I could do at home probably. But I just had to go and exercise. Um, and as I'm trying to get into grad school for psychology, I – um, started to change the way I was eating and then um, took out the inflammatory food. So basically geared more toward uh, paleo, hunter-gatherer, ancestral diet. And um, I ended up, uh, my cat allergies went away. My uh, pollen and dust mite allergies went away. And um, I'm like noticing that's happening, but I'm like really focused on the one tree in the forest of my shoulder because I wanted to go kayaking. And, and um I do a lot of volunteer work with Team River Runner, teaching vets how to kayak too. And uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of things that the river has um, changed my life in so many ways through kayaking. And um, and that's even how I met my wife. So I um, I ended up um, being like being invited to talk at all these different CrossFit gyms and was kind of just telling my story about hey, this is not about just you know losing fat, gaining muscle and, you know, looking better naked. This is, uh, <laughs> this is like, and performance improvement. So this is about, you know, my aller my cat allergies went away and then my, an, an old injury, um, chronic inflammation and an old injury, uh, could actually fully heal up. And, uh, then I found myself out in Portland, Oregon. Um, I chose that venue cause I'd never been to Oregon and I, uh, found the NTA and went through the NTP program and I've had a practice uh, connected to CrossFit Dahlonega ever since and uh, had a, it's kind of crazy, uh, a career beginning shoulder injury. So, <laughs> Yeah, it's super interesting because a lot of times people's bodies are super jacked up internally, but they don't know it until you know, the yep. straw breaks the camel's back. And for you, that was your shoulder yep. was just enough to push your entire body over the edge. So it's fascinating to see how that shoulder injury led to you discovering so much more about your body. Yes. And, and still to this day, like, um, anytime anybody, a, a friend or anybody I know gets injured, you know, I always let them know, like, there's going to be a lot of neat things you're going to learn from this. It's, but nobody gets injured and goes, yes, what am I going to learn now? You know, <laughs> but, um, but, uh, through injuries, through pain and suffering comes growth. And so I, I didn't really do much yoga, fell in love with yoga. And then, um, and then, uh, gosh, it's so much sweeter being back out on the river, um, helping people or for, um, my own pleasure. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and it's nice not being allergic to pollen or cats and stuff like that and, and sleeping better and whatnot. So, yeah, it's a big part of it. But, yeah, it usually takes us to hit rock bottom in some form or fashion for us to kind of go, okay, I need to dig a little deeper here and, and figure this out. So do you think your depression came from your – inability to be able to do the things that you love or was it on a deeper level and it was just brought forth from the injury and everything else going on in your body yeah I think um well there was kind of a little bit of depression was starting to come back with the injury for sure but the main darkest part of the depression was back in college um and then knowing what you know we all learned through the NTP program like through the NTA, um, you know, the majority of serotonin production is made in the gut. So that alone is kind of, uh, we didn't talk about that in psychology classes or um, either, or I missed that psychology class. I, I think that's fairly new enough research to where we just talked about the brain the whole time. 
um, but not anything about the gut. And I look back and think about, you know, all the pizza and tequila and whatever and, and fast food. And I'm like, well, no wonder I was depressed. And then, you know, you couple that with um, some traumas that happened um, growing up, which nobody gets through unscathed. And um, I think uh, half of it's psychology and half of it's physiology of my gut and what it, how it was affecting my brain. And then uh, with that injury, I was starting to slide a little bit back toward that, I think. Um, but then, uh, and I was actually on one medication. I was, Back in college, I got out of the hospital and they had me on five different meds. And then um, it took me 10, took me 10 years, yep, 10 years to get off all those meds. But uh, um, with... There's other factors, but with uh, rock climbing, um, actually backpacking, I fell in love with backpacking, and then five meds went down to four, and then with rock climbing, four meds went down to three, and then when I started whitewater kayaking, I went from three to one, so that kind of tells you something about how amazing uh, whitewater kayaking is and inter interacting with uh, a force of nature like the river, and um, there's other things in there too, a lot of less a lot less tequila and a lot, lot a less uh, staying up late at night. You know, those are also factors too. Um, so it wasn't just the outdoor um, passions that I was falling in love with that were a great exercise also. Um, but yeah, I just knew like if you chop my arms and legs off, I'm going to figure out how to kayak. <laughs> so I had to get back to that. So uh, we hear all the time that, uh, you know, disease starts in the gut. And so everybody comes on and they talk about the gut, and that's kind of the primary spot for people to talk about. Uh, however, you definitely look a lot more at the brain as well in relation to the gut. So can you talk about some of the different ways that you're looking at how the brain functions in regards to how the rest of the body functions? Yeah. Yeah. So um, like in the first year of my practice, um, I would be helping people like healing their gut lining or improving digestion and absorption rates. And, um, you know, our stomach is supposed to be this acidic holding tank. And then, uh, and then the gut lining is supposed to be, you know, strong enough and, and not too permeable. And then it drops down to the small intestines and then we absorb the nutrients in the small intestines. And, and that helps with not only for energy for our day and, uh, from reading a book to, to exercise, to our jobs, and being a, a mom, dad, sister, brother, husband, wife, whatever. Um, but it, but it also goes towards cellular division. So that's like you know what we absorb is going toward repairing the heart, uh, the brain, you know our adrenal glands, um, every organ in the body. You know our our bones are constantly remodeling. Um, there's all these different aspects of cellular division that fascinated me. And we learned about neurology in the NTP program. But in that first year of my practice, I'd have like half of my clients were super excited, feeling great because I was helping their gallbladder and their, their overall digestion, their, um, whether they needed hydrochloric acid support or if they needed gut healing nutrients and then um, maybe some liver liver and kidney support or something to help cleanse their liver and kidneys and uh things are getting better and better but then i had this other population of uh other half maybe maybe half 30 to 50 percent of clients that just weren't they were seeing improvements but they weren't excited as excited as the other group of uh, the other part of uh, my clients and so i was trying to figure out why just racking my brain no pun intended. And then uh, coincidentally, I I saw so many people that had like um, there was uh, early onset of puberty or late onset of puberty, like their their um, pituitary and neurology signs or symptoms were really low. But if they had early or late onset of puberty, it was like they boom, like every every person. So before age 10 or after age 13 every one of those people were testing well for neurological support. And there's like, uh, whether it be pituitary and hypothalamus glandular support, or if it's uh, female or male specific, um, neurological support. Um, 
And then these people, once I helped their brain kind of like turn the lights on more, um, help with neurology, then everything of their got better. Um, and they were able to, um, benefit even more from the protocol that they were already on. And it was, uh, it was a huge game changer, um, for all these people that, and then they became excited. I <laughs> like the other, the rest of the group. So. Are there any specific symptoms that help you to determine what part of the brain to focus on and uh, which direction to go to support these brain functions? Yes. Uh, one of the most common things I see is um, lack of thirst. This is one of the simplest things, uh, lack of thirst or excessive thirst. Um, for example, I had lack of thirst, but when I got to the gym, I would have excessive thirst. It was like my brain would finally go, oh, crap, you know, I know what you're about to do. We need to we need to hydrate. <laughs> and I would almost get slower times at the workouts because I was going to the water fountain and people would make fun of me. And I was like, I don't get it. I, this is so weird. Um, but looking back, you know, now I understand what was happening. So if we if someone has excessive thirst or lack of thirst, that's a, a tall tale sign of the pituitary and hypothalamus needs some support. I think mainly more so the hypothalamus, but it takes 60 to 90 days on average to rehydrate the pituitary and hypothalamus. And, and a lot of us are dehydrated at a cellular level, um, whether it be the brain or other parts of the body. So, um, and, and that was another part where I didn't understand I didn't see, I almost would look overlook it, the lack of thirst or excessive thirst. So if we have excessive thirst, then yeah, sure, it can be because it's hot out and whatnot. But if we have excessive thirst, then uh, we can drink too much water and then we are dehydrating ourselves by overhydrating. So we're peeing out our electrolytes and minerals. So there's that. So that is an optimum, right? And then if there's a lack of thirst, then, you know, it takes a ton of water to have one bowel movement. Um, so digestion is usually off. There's not much water going through the liver and kidneys um, to help with detoxing. Um, um, there's all kinds of aspects. Like, I mean, everything from our, from our eyes needing moisture, like so many different parts of our body needs water. Every cell in the body needs water. Um, so the, Helping the pituitary and hypothalamus first usually is like a huge home run for people. Um, and uh, there's other, besides early onset of puberty or late onset of puberty, there's a uh, memory failing. And that can look, you know, different many ways. But somebody might say, yeah, I have some uh, memory issues, whether it's short term or long term. Uh, tolerate sugar, feel fine when eating sugar. And I would, I would joke and when I went through the NTP program of like, oh, yeah, I feel fine eating sugar. <laughs> but uh, that wasn't a good thing. So um, there's increased libido, decreased libido um, is a sign or symptom of it could be a lot of things. Um, maybe the relationship isn't going that well or something. <laughs> um, or uh, it can be a pituitary and hypothalamus um, needing some support. There's also... Um, Height, uh, being really, really short, technically under 4'10", or really, really tall, so height over 6'6". Six, six. Um, but I've seen some people that are 6'3", need pituitary support, or uh, height under 4'10". I've seen some people be 5'2", and still need pituitary support. So I just kind of roughly say kind of short or kind of tall can be one indicator. Or splitting type headache, and usually it's right here which is the pituitary point we learned, but it's uh, a point on the forehead in between the eyes um, and a little bit above that. Um, some type, sometimes people get a headache right there or they consciously or subconsciously rub that point. Um, they, they might not even realize they're doing it, but that's stimulating the pituitary um, and, and the hypothalamus a little bit. Um, there's also menstrual disorders, which could be for numerous reasons. I mean, the gallbladder being sluggish alone can contribute to that. And, but a lot of times, you know, whether it's all a woman's life or all of a sudden the, 
her cycle starts to get kind of wonky, then uh, that can be a need for neurological support to help relay the information, the neurology to her endocrine system. And then tendency to ulcers or colitis, which, you know, you think of that as just being a, a gut thing and what the person's eating and whatnot. But it could be that neurologically something's not uh, being sent from the brain to the stomach during digestion. So those are the main ones that I see pop up um, that uh, I ask people about. So a lot of times on their graph, they have a really low graph on their system burn analysis graph. But then uh, it might be the one thing is, you know, they, they just don't ever drink any water or they're like they drink a massive amount of water. And I think any of these really has a lot of weight to it. And even though it doesn't show high up on the graph, I think the, the, the brain needs nourishment because the gut feeds the brain. Um, but a lot of times, you know, we've lately been getting excited about only the gut, which is great. But, uh, and some people even call in the gut the first brain and then the brain the second brain. So either way you look at it, the gut to brain connection overall is like is crucial. So let's talk a little bit more about um, hydration because yeah. a lot of people, you know, they wake up, the first thing they have is a coffee and usually they don't just have one cup of coffee. They have multiple cups of coffee, which is dehydrating. Um, yeah. So what are some ways to help people to rehydrate without stripping out minerals? Do you add certain minerals to water or what are some other ways that you use? You could do... Um... It's pretty neat to do this. There's uh, something called Sole water or Sol, it's S-O-L-E water, but it's just pink Himalayan salt in a glass jar. Um, I usually send uh, a link for Wellness Mama has a little blog um, about it, about Sole water. And um, you just put it in a, a glass jar, shake it up, let um, the water will pull all the electrolytes and minerals into the water molecule overnight and then um, and you just put like a teaspoon or two of that you know maybe more maybe less in your overall you know water cup you know in the morning and that's going to help um, not only with electrolytes and minerals and just overall hydration but it'll help with the uh, adrenals too the adrenals get um, they get really happy if we have some electrolytes and minerals on board um, and yeah, if coffee is instead of taking away the coffee, I think helping pituitary and hypothalamus, adding some soleil water and or helping even just the gallbladder alone, people start getting that kick or that oomph from their breakfast and they drink less and less coffee over time and then their sleep gets better and then hormones gets better and all kinds of things uh, just kind of this cascade of healing happens pretty neat. Yeah. And for, um, people to know the adrenals are related to the hypothalamus and pituitary via the HPA axis as well. So it's yeah. all kind of connected. And then stress also plays a big role in how everything's working up, up top as well. Yes. Uh, so can you talk about some important nutrients, uh, to help optimize the brain? Most of the time, it's uh, pituitary and hypothalamus glandular tissue. So it's actually, you know, some people are a little bit like, I want to do just plant-based um, supplements or nutrients. And, and you can do that, and everything will go toward helping. But the, what I've seen, you know, pack the most punch or help the most is actual um, glandular pituitary and hypothalamus support. Um, and sometimes adrenal glandular support. Um, but it's a rarity. It's like um, I call – it's a rarity we put that in our food, you know. And who puts pituitary and hypothalamus support in their smoothie, you know. So <laughs> – um, and when I – in my first year of my practice too, I was kind of like more of a food Nazi and then less of a – less, you know, supplementation. But the more and more I realized like um, – you know, it, I thought it was like 80% self-discipline and willpower. Um, and the more and more I've seen, uh, this, is probably, this is my fifth year, 
my practice, everybody I've helped, it um, it almost works better to help give test the body, figure out which nutrients they need, especially like, you know, you can do a whole 30 and that does some major house cleaning. Um, but at the same time, there's no pituitary and hypothalamus glandular support uh, in, in the whole 30. So, or even the gallbladder, like maybe there's a recipe out there or five recipes with beets in it, but it's, there's not pancreolipase, you know, in a lot of people's recipes that not only helps the pancreas, but it helps the gallbladder. So, you know, I'm a huge fan of not only plant, you know, based like adaptogens, um, but also for um, animal glandular tissue support. So, and, you know, they, they sew uh, heart valves from a pig. They'll sew that into a person. So that kind of shows you that our bodies know animal animals and plant um, nutrients and tissues. So the body recognizes it and knows how to use it. So, Yeah, people can go and eat all those different organs if they really want to. Yeah. Um, but I'm assuming it's not very tasty. Yeah. This is kind of – I'm glad you mentioned that. So uh, most of the time, the pituitary and hypothalamus, it's in a tablet. You know, that's way easier than going to a local farm and – getting these actual um, parts of the brain and have the local farmer look at you like, well, my grandpa used to do this, but, <laughs> um, but instead of doing that, the, these tablets are way easier to, to take um, with either, you know, with each meal or whenever it ends up you testing well for. Um, but most of the time people can't taste them when it's on their tongue. Um, it's kind of fascinating though. If, uh, through the lingual neuro testing process that we as NTPs do, a lot of times if a you know start with beta TCP or something that helps the gallbladder, um, that uh, I've seen when, whenever I see oh well I can't taste it you know the person I always asks them what does this smell like what does this taste like I'm trying to see where their their brain is and their taste buds are at and where. Um, what's being relayed uh, as far as neurology is going. Um, and if they can't taste something that typically like has a taste like beets or uh, that gallbladder support gets called a healthy sweet tart so many times with people. <laughs> and um, if they can't taste that, I have them put um, cytosine PTHPT, which is pituitary and hypothalamus support. I have them put that on their tongue and they never can taste that one. But then it starts to brighten up the taste of the beta TCP, for example. Um, so they're like, whoa, this is weird. This is kind of – I don't taste this second one that's on my tongue, but I'm tasting the first one now. Um, so that's pretty neat. And you could actually, you know, lingual neuro test with just pituitary and hypothalamus support, and you could see the gallbladder get better. But then most of the time we need some type of nutrients – like that have uh, that support the gallbladder and help prime it, and then you'll see um, that accompany with neurological support. You see a lot more improve because you know all that neurology is uh, awake and firing faster or more efficiently. However, you want to look at it. Super fascinating. Yeah. Um, are there also different environmental stressors that can impact the brain as well? Yes, I'm glad you asked that. <laughs> Um, I've been, uh, learning a lot from Brian Hoyer. He's a good buddy of mine and, um, I'm about to go through the training, um, and be the Southeast, um, pro or rep, um, for his company shielded healing, but, uh, EMFs, um, like sleeping with our phone beside our bed, you know, that, that affects the blood brain barrier and, um, that's not very that's not very optimum to the to our brain, of course. Um, and so some people will definitely make fun of it and call some stuff tin foil hats, you know, stuff. But I've seen where I'm I'm you know peeling back the layers, uh, chipping away at stuff with a client, numerous clients, and uh, and we get to a point where I'm like, huh. Like they're kind of, their body is kind of telling me something in a different way. 
and I test points and uh, things are just something just kind of has, this is in the past like four years. Um, I didn't ask this any at all in the first year of my practice, but I would ask them about if where the wireless router is um, compared to their bedroom. And then, um, and you know, how many phones or devices are in the bedroom. Um, and just to, to tell them like, okay, well, humor me and like just put a timer on your wireless router to where your, your router turns off at night. Um, even if it is kind of, kind of far from the bedroom, you know, maybe it's close to the kid's bedroom or a guest bedroom and your, your friend or your parents are in town and, and their, their blood brain barriers getting, uh, you know, not attacked, but well, kind of attacked, but, uh, you know, just put a, you know, a timer on your wireless router to where it just turns off like a lamp does, you know, and then uh, put your phone on airplane mode. Some people will even turn their phones off, but um, they want to be able to have their alarm. Um, and maybe I think emergency contacts might be able to come through if it's on airplane mode, but maybe not. But uh, Or if they just insist on leaving their phone on completely, um, putting it across the room, you know, far farther away than just on the nightstand right near the body. Um, cause that phone, even though we're not using it, it's constantly communicating. Um, even if all the apps are closed, it's constantly communicating. And, you know, I always say this, like, um, we, it's kind of frustrating, but mostly fascinating. We will, I don't know if we'll ever have all the answers to the human body, but um, we, I mean, so if we don't have all the answers to the brain or the human body in general um, as a whole, or it's tiny, amazing parts, um, then how do we know what the effects of this, you know, new and neat technology um, has on the body? Um, like the glymphatic system, that's amazing. That was just discovered and not that long ago, like maybe 2012 or 2013, the glymphatic system, uh, they were they're trying to figure out why the brain doesn't have, like the lymphatic system doesn't go up to the brain. Like why would that be? And um, they, they saw or figured out all these glial cells around the brain. And um, one of their functions was to help um, compress the brain. So supposedly our brain compresses itself I use the analogy of it's kind of like a sponge, like a clean sponge. You go to wash your car, and then you, you're wiping your car down, and then you put the sponge in the water, like the clean water, and you squeeze it, and all this dirt like kind of expels. So our, our body does this in good deep sleep, and it compresses the brain. Supposedly they found like 30 to 40 percent. Um, our brain kind of squeezes itself, and then like uh, then these toxins um, – will be handed off to the lymphatic system and then and then the body you know expels it uh later on that day you know so i mean this is this was just recently discovered you'd think something like the brain kind of shrinking or squeezing itself so to speak would would have been discovered a long time ago but um this is fairly new research and so if we're still learning about the body then um, I think that uh, we should maybe take a look at at least at least help protect when our body is in the most parasympathetic state, um, which is in you know good deep sleep. Um, and so for sure that'll help the pituitary and hypothalamus if you start to especially shield the bedroom, um, which there's different kinds of uh, paint, and you can paint over any type of uh, color. Um, paint that you want, but painting the bedroom and and uh, there's curt there's fabric for curtains as well if you have windows and um, and there's even people make like my wife and I we have a, a canopy um, we live in a log cabin so we didn't want to paint the walls so we have a, a bed canopy um, that goes over our bed and it just looks like you know it's like a sheer fabric so light and air can travel through it but um, it, it's uh, woven, embedded with, uh, from what I remember, I think it's, maybe it's silver. Um, but anyway, it, it shields out, because we have a cell tower that's on the mountain, 
or hill, <laughs> the hill uh, kind of near our house. So there's a cell tower not too far away that we are getting blasted with. So trying to protect my family <laughs> from anything I can, I guess. Yeah, the whole EMF thing is super fascinating. We've had Brian Hoyer on a couple times, and it seems like more and more information is coming out about it. And right now, I can't remember which country it is, but there's a country over in Europe that's fighting back against 5G, and they will not have 5G in their country whatsoever. So it's yep. definitely interesting, the research coming out. I know. And there's – um, I can't remember the – there's some – there's a – I think it's a military, like, um, I guess you'd call it a weapon, but there's some type of 5G, like, crowd control weapon, I, and I think there's video of it on YouTube or on something. Um, there's some probably even more credible sources, but um, but because uh, I know people will be skeptical about, you know, oh, this is just a YouTube video. It could have been doctored up, but there's um, – there's, different aspects of frequencies that can help the body and then hurt the body. And so um, I think that what it'll be interesting to see what we see in, in big cities when uh, 5G is rolled out and in the next year or so of whether it be sleep problems or road rage or whatever, um, some of those numbers go up, you know, maybe de depression rates go up. Um, other other aspects um so yeah it's it's definitely <laughs> some of my buddies and some of my clients even i joke with them about tinfoil hat stuff you know but uh but they'll the ones that turn their phones off or put it on airplane mode or put it away from the body um like in the bathroom or across the room or something um and have a their timer um put a timer on their wireless router they do see increased sleep. Sometimes they have to they have to see like spend a month with it like of doing that, forming that habit, and then almost like some of them just by their own you know idea of doing this. And sometimes I've suggested it or let them know, hey, you might not notice it until you like sleep somewhere where there is your phone. You left your phone on, and then there's or there is a wireless router on at night. Um, or you could turn that stuff back on <laughs> at night and then let that go for a week or two. And you could then that's when the skeptics are like, oh, man, I, I haven't been sleeping good. This, this is there's something to this. And then they turn everything back off again while they're sleeping and um, and they they see improvement. So sometimes it's. You know, I don't feel a difference until something that's maybe a stressor is brought back into our life. And then we see, oh, this is, this does have an effect on my body. So that's kind of cool. Yeah. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how to, you know, get the brain to function better. Because if someone has gut issues and then they have brain issues going on at the same time and you need the gut to be working properly in order to absorb nutrients, do you then focus on the gut first before you focus on the brain? Or what type of route do you go with that? Um, so usually, usually something with like, uh, I'll just test the body. I'll just, uh, by the the test points, I'll, I'll ask um, the body, the person's body, what they're, what they're saying, what's highest priority. And if they're on these test points, you know, it's on a zero to 10 pain scale of these. Um, and if they're a bunch of zeros and ones, you know, a lot of male clients are zeros and ones because us guys are just typically are either pain scales are really high and so the numbers are really low or we're a little bit out of touch with our bodies um but whether male or female if the numbers are really low but their their complaints you know their signs and symptoms like their graph is kind of high or you know they're they're coming into me for whatever reason sleep or digestion or allergies or headaches or whatever um i first um, if the number's really low, then I'll have them put 
um, pituitary and hypothalamus support. I'll have them put that tablet on their tongue and then retest. And then all of a sudden now they have like, oh, this is a four and that's a seven. And they actually uh, have numbers showing up. So that's almost their baseline. And then I'll test uh, gallbladder support or some type of uh, either gut lining healing nutrients or, you know, some type of HCL support or whether it be apple cider vinegar or um, hydrochloric acid or something like that. Um, and uh, it just depends. Each person's different, you know, bio individuality. But uh, most of the time what I see is I'd say about seven out of ten people need pituitary and hypothalamus support. Um, they, they could see improvements with just gut healing nutrients or just gallbladder support. And, um, but then, uh, you know, sometimes the body's like, okay, this person is pituitary, um, signs or symptoms are off the chart, but they're not testing well for pituitary and hypothalamus support. It's like, oh, why is this happening? And it's like, you just got to start small and start with, gallbladder and or gut healing nutrients to help start to open some detox pathways and then they come in two or three weeks later and boom they test really well for neurological support um, for usually pituitary and hypothalamus um, or sometimes it's gender specific support um, and it's like if, if we give if I had given them if the person had taken uh, pituitary and hypothalamus support and the gallbladder support, it might have been too much, too much of a good thing too soon. You know, it's shifting too many gears. So you just want to always test, and then you can kind of figure out the the layers of what the person's body is wanting to address. You know, in each appointment. And then um, a few weeks ago, we had Dr. Brandon Brock on the show to talk about how concussions can influence the brain. Uh, is head injury something that you're taking a look at too, and people's um, uh, previous experiences with concussions or head injuries? And if so, what are you looking for with the head injuries? Um, I haven't, I actually haven't had that many. Um, I've had some clients with concussions, but I wouldn't say that I like have a concussion protocol or anything like that. But, um, but a lot of times, um, uh, shielding the bedroom or taking away some of those uh, environmental stressors. Um, doing that, I've seen some clients that have had concussions in the past. That help. Um, pituitary and hypothalamus support, um, which then that can help hydration if they drink too much water or don't drink enough water. Then um, that can help. There's there is um, a few different homeopathic uh, remedies that can help with, there's one by Physica, I think it's Physica, yeah. It's a Ashura Brain, I think is kind of geared toward um, concussions. And there's also this, uh, a lot of times with concussions, this is kind of a funny side story too, but um, my wife's a physical therapist and she was, uh, when we met, she was in her third year of PT school, and she told was telling me about these uh, inner ear crystals, <laughs> and I thought she was messing with me, and trying. We were just dating at the time, and you know, getting to know each other, and uh, I thought she was kind of um, seeing how gullible I was or something, because <laughs> I'd never heard of inner ear crystals. This is way before I became an NTP, way before the shoulder injury or any of that, and. Uh, I was like, oh, yeah, very funny. I'm not falling for that. And uh, But it turns out we have inner ear crystals, and um, there's a simple adjustment um, that PTs and uh, I think some chiropractors do it too. Um, and I've seen her do it here, you know, um, or at her clinic. Um, and it's pretty fascinating to where a lot of those – a lot of times those people had had some type of concussion – or concussions over the years and uh, they were having some vertigo issues or headaches or different aspects and that alone can be um, a help you know to somebody who has had some concussions over the years awesome 
Well, Greg, thank you so much for sharing all this information. Do you have any final thoughts that you want to share with um, different ways to nourish the brain and support the brain? Um, yeah, I'd say, um, you know, if you, if any of this of what I've said during this podcast is kind of like spoke to you, you know, reach out to me. Um, my email is R O L nutrition at iCloud.com. And, um, just know that if you, if you out of self-discipline and willpower, you, you keep backsliding with some aspect of, of eating healthier or, um, you know, whether it be going to the gym or with trying to get to bed earlier, any of this, uh, there can be a neurological aspect of this. Um, and I'm pretty darn sure neurology and physiology will trump even the strongest of willpower and self-disciplined people. Um, and I've been told I'm very strong willed <laughs> and, uh, I I've seen, uh, myself backslide after, you know, whole certain like a whole 30 or I'll do, you know, keto or this or that, you know, for a month or three months or six months or whatever. And then, um, I think, uh, there's just certain nutrients that we typically don't put in our food anymore that, um, we need to incorporate into our diet and, you know, not only nourish the gut, um, which is either the second brain or it's the first brain. <laughs> and then, uh, that'll, nourishing the gut will also help nourish the brain and the rest of the body. So awesome. And you are a uh, river of life nutritional therapy, and we will have your email in the show notes at summit for wellness.com slash 74. Thanks Greg so much for coming on. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you for having me. As you can see, the brain really does influence a lot of the body, but also the gut does too, which is why we've had so many guests come on to talk about both of those different areas of the body because they both impact our overall health. Uh, so whether we start at the brain, start at the gut, or do a combination of both, you definitely want to find a practitioner that knows how to look at the entire body to be able to figure out where the root cause is and where to start. Okay, upcoming on the next episode, we have Chris Vaughn, who is an herbalist, and she is coming on to talk about how different flavors of herbs and food can influence different parts of the body. Let's just briefly check in with Chris and learn more about her and what she is going to be talking about. We are joined with Chris Vaughn, who is a clinical herbalist. And uh, Chris, go ahead and tell us one unique thing about you that most people don't know. Most people would probably not know that I am an avid hiker and hunter. I ah. actually love to hunt with my husband and we um, hunt for food. So most I hunt deer and elk and that's the main meat that we eat in our home. So that's how we feed our family. Yeah. And getting one of those can probably supply you with enough food for the whole year. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what will we be learning in our interview together? We're going to be going into the five flavors of herbs and how learning the herbal flavors gives us clues as to what those herbs will do in the body. And it's a really simplified way of choosing the right herbs for what you're trying to handle in your own health. And then what are some of your favorite foods and nutrients that you think everyone should get more into their diet? Well, I think everyone should do more with their kitchen spices. So really get comfortable with everything that's already in your kitchen cabinet and just start cooking. Every meal that we make can be medicine for us if we really start to look at what we already have access to in our kitchen. And then I'm also a big um, advocate of really good, healthy fat in the diet. Um, we've, we've gone through many, many years of low fat, no fat, and it's caused a lot of cognitive issues, a lot of decline in brain health. So I'm a big proponent of really good, healthy fats for our brain health. 
I, I love that you brought that up because a brain is made up of a lot of fat and mostly fat. So, um, yeah, that whole low fat craze definitely did a number on the health of us. And then, uh, final question is what are your top three health tips for anyone who wants to improve their overall wellness? Top three health tips. Number one, slow down, do mm. less. We live in a world where we do too much. We're running ourselves ragged. So really embrace slowing down and having some boundaries. Um, number two, get back in your kitchen and cook. Most of us don't cook anymore. And we're really suffering with a lot of chronic health conditions because we're not cooking at home. And number three, uh, have fun. Most of us work so hard and we don't do anything that feeds our soul. So I encourage you to stop and take a look at what do you do even one time a week that deeply feeds your soul and do more of that. <laughs> It's kind of amazing how number one and two go kind of hand in hand, because if you have a fast paced life, then you're probably not cooking very often. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have a great episode next week, as you can see. So keep on climbing to the peak of your health, and we will see you next week.